Studio Ervo and Bonfire Press present Essence House by Eric J. Cockrell and Chuck Pino. Chapter 3. The Healing Hands of Time. Many amazing parties have been held in the enormous parlor of Essence House in its time. The past century saw the most amazing annual Christmas balls. Roland Edmond was known for his holiday festivities. The house was said to surpass capacity many a year. Neighbors never complained about the noise, nor their lack of invitation. They were all friendly with Roland and knew that family was the most important thing in the world, and only family was invited. Tim stood there in the parlor with his cousin Tristan. Suddenly, he was overtaken by a memory of watching as his grandfather gave a speech on the steps that extended across from where he stood. Gramps addressed the room every year. Some years he did so with a glass of whiskey, and some years he did so after several glasses of whiskey. The incident that danced in Tim's head just now was of a time that followed several whiskeys, and Gramps opted for a short speech, after which he took a spill on the floor and was carried off to his office that sat parallel to the parlor. Tim, spoke Tristan with his hand extended. Tim shook it off. He knew Tristan had been trying to get through to him for a good minute, but was so lost in thought that he couldn't respond and hadn't paid attention enough to do so, even if he could. I'm sorry, what was that again? Tim responded. Tristan again extended his hand. Turn off your phone's light and wake up. You've been in a daze ever since we got upstairs. I'm sorry, it's just... Tim started. Tristan headed to the adjoining kitchen. Breaker box has to be around here somewhere. Tristan, what is this? How is this possible? It's supposed to be gone. Tim finally woke from his fog. How would I know? Tristan retorted. Tim shrugged. Well, you knew it was here, so it stands to reason you might know a bit about it. Well, I honestly don't know anything. Just guesses, really, Tristan said as he shone the light around. And I don't know if you're ready for those. Try me, Tim regarded him solidly, his features devout of fear or any real emotion. He had a million guesses, and yet none all at once. Tristan's advantage was having had time to digest the insanity of all of it. Let me get the lights on, then we can talk, Tristan said as he threw open a cupboard. The sky lit up outside the house, enough to show that it was raining something fierce. Lightning cracked overhead. That's a strange storm for a January night, Tim thought to himself, but so much was strange that he didn't dare mention it out loud. Tristan flipped some switches, and after a few tries, the lights flickered and lit up the kitchen. There we go. The house lit up. Tim stepped back into the parlor to see if it matched his memory. It did. The stone fireplace against the wall, the mantle that held pictures of family members, and an ornate clock that looked as though it dated back well into the last century, if not longer. The upholstered bench that sat in front of the window, looking out onto the grounds. In the corner of the room was an old phonograph with the horn-style speaker. Against the walls were shelves of books that didn't look as though they had been touched in quite some time. Facing the fireplace were a pair of leather-backed chairs that swiveled. Tim remembered Grandfather seated in his chair, an ancient tome in his lap as he read fairy tales to Tim and the other children. They didn't get the modernized version either. Spoiler alert, the Little Mermaid turned into sea foam and died. I can't involve you in this, Tim. Please go back, declared Tristan. Are you serious? I'm not going anywhere without you. I told your father I'd keep tabs on you until he arrived. Tim grabbed Tristan's arm. Let's get back up to the shed and talk about this. Being in here creeps me out. Tristan yanked his arm from Tim's grip and gave Tim a shove. You won't stop me, Tim. Get out of here. Stop you, said Tim, clearly confused. Stop you from doing what exactly? Please, just leave. Tristan repeated his sentiment. Tim could hear the pleading tone in his voice, but he was having none of any of this. Something about this place, whatever this was, it was affecting Tristan. 
Was it a hallucination? A shared dream of some sort? This is all crazy. We are standing in a house that does not exist. It's been gone for about 25 years. I just stood on this spot yesterday. It's a parking lot. Tim had to rationalize this somehow. Because to believe, well, to believe was to drag himself into a pit of unknown, where nothing made sense and he couldn't possibly find the answers to be satisfied. Tristan headed towards the main staircase, heading up with loud, clomping footsteps. Tim chased him and grabbed him by the shoulder. Where the hell do you think you're going? Tim asked. For the first time since they had reunited, Tristan was the aggressor. His lower lip trembling as he shouted, spittle flying, as uncontained as his reaction. What do you care? You won't believe anyways. And you've seen where we are. He pushed Tim's hand off his shoulder to emphasize his point with a frustrated grunt. The two stared at each other for a long, uncomfortable silence. Tim wanted to say that he believed, but he didn't even know what he would be admitting to. None of this made any sense at all, and he couldn't find a single rope to cling to in this plunge from reality. No, that wasn't entirely true. If he could calm his cousin down, there was Tristan. By this time, Tristan had turned to face completely away from Tim, his shoulders rising and falling with his heavy breathing. Okay, you aren't wrong. Look, all I know is that somehow I'm inside of Essence House, a home that was knocked down like 20 or so years ago. So, yeah, I'm having a hard time believing anything. But I have no clue what is actually happening right now. So why don't you try to explain to me, as best as you possibly can, what's going on? And maybe I won't try to stop you from whatever it is you're talking about. Tristan nodded solemnly and waved back toward the parlor. Tim left Grandfather's chair for Tristan, hoping the familiarity would calm him down some. But it also felt apropos, since he was the one telling the story. Tristan breathed out a loud sigh. <sighs> so, yeah, this place was torn down in the late 90s after my mom and your parents died. Dad had spiraled out of control. He was drinking a lot. You and Elise had moved, so by that time, it was just he and I. I remember... He paused to gather up the courage to continue. One night, I heard Dad arguing right here. I had gotten up because of a bad dream or something, but the sound of loud voices kept me from going back to sleep. So I crept down the stairs, and I heard it much better. But here's the weird thing. Dad was yelling at Grandpa. Tim saw Tristan staring back at him, which quickly made him aware of his gaping mouth. He closed it sheepishly, but offered no reply. It was too soon for him to say anything, and if he did, it would be more doubting, which wouldn't help at all. Grandpa was sitting right here while Dad railed on him. I couldn't make out everything that he was saying, but basically, he couldn't believe that Grandpa wouldn't help to bring Mom back. Grandpa tried to assure him that there wasn't a way that it doesn't work like that, but Dad called him a coward. He said that was why Grandpa was dead, and no one cared to bring him back. Dad stormed out, and when I peeked into the parlor, Grandpa was sitting there quietly, with his hands in his lap, you know, the way he used to. He noticed me and waved me over. Tristan was relating the story, but he no longer seemed to notice Tim's reactions. He was lost in the memories. Of course, there was the obvious... You've gotten so big and all of that, but I had to ask him how he was still alive. Tim, he said, finally regarding his cousin for the first time in what seemed like minutes. He looked me straight in the eyes and said, I'm not. He went on to tell me that the only people in the house that were alive were me and my dad. The house, he said, was magical. Yeah, okay, I see your face, but these are his words, not mine, all right? Just listen. Tim tried to control his features, apologized, and beckoned for Tristan to continue. He said that the house both existed in the present and in the past, all the way back to when it had been built on this spot. I laughed at him, but that's when he told me the one thing that made me believe him. Tristan finally seemed as close to normal as possible. Of course, the two of them were seated in a parlor that had been torn down decades before, so normal was a really relative term at this point. 
Grandpa died in 1972. That's like 15 years before I was even born. And yet, we hung out with him all the time when we were growing up. How do you explain that? Tim caught himself. The more things were drifting from any form of reality, the more they made sense. Crap, Barnabas was right, he muttered. Tristan narrowed his eyes, but Tim waved him off. Yeah, don't worry about it. Compared to this, it's literally nothing, Tim sighed. You're now the second person today to tell me that Gramps had died that long ago, so I'm not even going to argue the point. So if I put aside my doubts and just accept the fact that this place now has more in common with a DeLorean than a house, what would I be trying to stop you from doing? Tristan regarded Tim with every ounce of sincerity he had. He knew in his mind he had only one chance at this. If Tim didn't go for it now, he wouldn't at all. I just... Knowing what we know about this place and what it can allow us to do, I... Well, I just can't stop thinking about the plane crash. No. Tim's eyes widened, and he caught himself shaking his head slowly. His mind whirled with so many thoughts that his body simply took over. The responses were instant. Even his mouth moved and words formed, all while he tried to grasp at anything that could make sense. He was incredibly unsuccessful. That's crazy. You can't change anything. It happened already. Gramps even said so. Tim's autopilot had decided it was not letting this discussion go any further. That's absolute crap, Tim. You didn't even know such a thing was possible ten minutes ago, and now you're telling me what you can and can't do? You have no idea what's possible, and Grandpa was probably just worried that he would lose another son before his time. I could save my mom, your parents even, and everything could be better. My dad wouldn't be so certifiable. The house would still be standing. How can you possibly be against this? What kind of proof can you have that this won't work? Proof? You want proof? Tim spat, holding his hands out to begin the count. All we have is stories that something like this exists, and it never goes well. So the only proof I have is three Back to the Future movies, anything with the name Terminator, one bad Star Trek movie, and every version of The Flash. Tristan snarled visibly. No way! I refuse to listen to some stupid rioters who have no clue that something like this could even exist. We have an opportunity to right wrongs. We get our parents back. My dad won't have made so many mistakes. He'd be a better version of himself. Things were finally clicking for Tim. He was getting control of his brain and was thinking ahead. He pointed to the door they had come in. No, we've got to leave now. Your dad is exactly why we can't do this. He knows about what this place can do and still doesn't want you here. He doesn't want either of us knowing the potential and power Essence House has. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Rick knows better. If he doesn't want us here, there's a damned good reason for it. Tristan flexed his fists. He wanted to knock Tim off his feet so bad, but what would that accomplish? And really, could he? Tim looked like Chicago had toughened him up, at least a little bit. With a bitter sigh, he took the first steps towards the door. I'll go, but... I'm not going to promise you that I won't find a way to bring them back. The two made a silent retreat back to the shed, Tim closing every door behind them. Tristan refused to speak to him from that moment on, and while Tim was putting the mower and snowblower away and closing and locking the shed, Tristan exited quietly from the scene. Tim, sadly, was no help. For some reason, he was under his father's thumb, but there was nothing that could be done about it now. No, what he needed to focus on was the how. He could break into the shed, no problem. A trip to the hardware store, some bolt cutters, and that problem was dealt with. No, the real problem was how did they travel through time. From his limited experience, and from what Grandpa had said, the house was in every instance of time, from when it had been built to when it had been destroyed. So, how could he go about making the house want to be in the end of 1994? His first stop was the hardware store for bolt cutters. If he didn't grab them while he was thinking about it, he would find himself ready to time travel without being able to open a damned lock. His next step was to go to the local second-hand store. He walked around scanning through clothes, 
games, toys, and anything he could remember from his youth. Anytime he found something that might work, he checked the internet. Was it a thing in 1994? He picked up an album and checked the date it was released. He couldn't believe his luck. November 1994, shortly before the time of the fateful plane crash. No, he told himself. It wasn't fate, and I'm going to prove that. Screw Dad, screw Tim, screw fate. He didn't need any of them for this. He found himself standing at a cash register with a bag full of stuff that he wouldn't have looked at twice on any other occasion. After this, the plan was to head home and get some rest. He needed to get to the shed when no one would be awake, and he had to do it immediately before Tim could get the chance to get any real security on the building, and before his dad returned to muck everything up. Rick Edmond sat back in the uncomfortable airplane seat. He had grown a little too big to comfortably appreciate flight, but this was an emergency. The embarrassment of having to ask for a seatbelt extender alone would have been reason enough for him to drive. But with Tristan trying to break into the shed, and Tim too slow-witted to stop him, there really wasn't any other choice. With a heaving sigh, he clicked on the extra belt and pulled out his laptop. He searched for a nicer hotel room than what he had offered Tim. He deserved it. He was an old man, and as far as the family was concerned, the singular patriarch. He had earned better sleeping conditions than a motel. Staring out the window as the plane ascended, darkness completely around him, all he could see was his shadow staring back at him. They're going to screw it up for all of us, he grumbled as the woman across the aisle gave him a strange look and held tighter to her purse. Late that evening, well past the time when the small town had pretty much shut down, Tristan crept up to the roll-up door. He had an old backpack on, wore baggy jeans that hung a little lower than they normally might, and a heavy jacket. Pulling the bolt cutters out of his pack, he approached the door and gave the snips a practice cut or two. Save your strength. I've got the keys right here, you asshole. Tim approached from behind him, key ring held up for Tristan to easily make out, even in the moonlit darkness. Tristan caught himself holding the cutters in front of him, almost threateningly, but dropped his hands to his sides when he saw what was going on. Tim pushed Tristan aside as the latter watched, turned the light on his phone, and helped the only way he could right now. What changed your mind? Tristan asked sheepishly. Tim chuckled slightly as he pulled off the lock and started to open the door. The thought you're going to do this, almost no matter what I do. Unless I want to sleep here or spend hundreds of dollars on surveillance equipment, you're going to find a way back, and then you won't have anyone watching your back when this thing goes tits up which I still think it might. He added emphasis to the final statement, hoping that he could change the young man's mind, but understanding in his heart the futility of even trying. As Tim pulled down the door behind them, Tristan looked to see that the mower and blower were parked off to either side of the shed so they could just slip the cover back and go down the stairs. He pulled on the heavy handle as Tim stepped up behind him. Nice jacket. The light blue logo. That's the old ranger's jacket, right? Tristan nodded as he started down the stairs. Yeah, from back when they won the cup in 94. Tim cocked his head as he followed down the stone stairs. Wait, you wore a jacket from when they died. Is that your plan? He started to laugh to himself while Tristan scowled. Hey, I'm trying, okay? I've got a plan. So your ass hanging out of those jeans is part of the plan, I'm guessing? Tim couldn't suppress his laughter while they made their way through the wine cellar and back up to the house. Screw you, Tristan grumbled as he took off his jacket and tossed it on Grandpa's chair. He carried his pack over to the phonograph. Tim narrowed his eyes as he saw that his cousin was wearing a faded pink t-shirt, but the underarms looked to be slowly encroaching with a blue color that spread out. You've got to be freaking kidding me, he said in glee as he dashed over and grabbed the back of Tristan's shirt. Tristan whipped around and swatted at Tim, but not before it was noticed that the spot where Tim had grasped was now turning blue as well. Now that they faced each other, the words hypercolor were easily seen on the front. You are completely 90s, Tim gasped, grinning broadly. I both love and hate it. 
Tristan bristled and pulled a record from his pack. Hey, this outfit will help us to get where we want to go. That and this. He held the record up. It was Willie Nelson, looking as old as ever. He didn't know the album, though he, like anyone else, enjoyed Willie, or at least didn't mind him. This is the Healing Hands of Time album. It came out two months before the plane crash. I'm going to play it, and we'll close our eyes, imagine where we want to go, and hopefully something good happens. Tim shrugged and took a seat in the other chair. It's our best shot, I guess. The needle scratched the surface of the record as music slowly started to slip out of the long horn that worked as a speaker. Tim closed his eyes, sighed, and let the music flow through him. He tried to take in the memories of early January 1995, before the plane that had held his parents and Tristan's mom had crashed, when life was easier. He felt himself drift away as Willie's words whispered in his ears. So I've already reached mountain peaks. I've just begun to climb. I'll get over you by clinging to those healing hands of time. Tim's eyes slowly opened and he peered around him. They were not in the Essence House anymore. Theme music by Carol Cockrell. Hey, this is Eric Cockrell. And Chuck Pino. The creators of Essence House. We're really excited that you took the time to listen and hope that you enjoyed it. We'd love your support on Patreon. $2 gets you two episodes a month, along with bonus commentary and our monthly chat show. Visit EssenceHouseStory.com and Searcy. Thank you so much for checking out our series. We're really excited about it.